One of my favorite authors uh, is Max Lucado. And he tells a story about Chippy, the parakeet. Chippy, the parakeet, was a very happy little songbird. Chippy was so happy, in fact, that his constant chirping just seemed to brighten everyone's day. One day, the owner of Chippy, the woman, was cleaning the bottom of Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner hose when the telephone rang and she turned to pick it up. She barely said hello when, sop, Chippy got sucked in. Horrified, the bird owner dropped the phone, turned the vacuum off and ripped open the bag and there was Chippy still alive but stunned and covered in soot and, and dust. She grabbed Chippy, raced to the bathroom sink, turned on the faucet and held Chippy under the full force of the running water. The more she tried to wash him, the worse he looked as the bird sat soaked and shivering, full of compassion for her loving songbird. She reached for the hairdryer and blasted her pet with hot air. Finally, she got the bird dry and put him back in his cage, but poor Chippy never knew what hit him. Several days later, a friend of the owner called and asked how Chippy was doing. Well, he's alive, she said, but he just sits in his cage and stares into space. And she added thoughtfully, Chippy really doesn't sing anymore. Have you ever felt like Chippy? Have you ever been sucked in washed up, blown over? Has your song ever been ripped from your heart because of the circumstances of life? Have you gotten the pink slip, the rejection letter, the medical report, the divorce papers, the failing grade? Has the check bounced? Has the policeman stopped at your front door? Has the pitfalls of life sucked you in? Has the cold water of reality left you washed up? Has the sting of the hot air of empty promises left you just hanging on and staring into space? Well, no doubt we watch helplessly what the events of the world do to people, our friends, our neighbors, natural disasters, economic collapses, mass poverty, unstable governments, destruction to the environment, and war. Just a few weeks ago, my team and I returned from Eastern Europe where, uh, we, where we met with Ukrainian refugees, and they told us in terrible detail of the horrors of the war they lived through in places like Kharkiv, Kyrgyzstan, Kiev, Dnipro, Maripol, and other places. We heard from women who spent days at a time stranded on the rooftops of their homes and soldiers intentionally flooding their village by blowing up a nearby dam and offering no rescue and no help. They would tell us in gruesome detail of seeing neighbors perish from starvation on those rooftops and then what they would see as the waters begin to recede. They shared desperate memories of how they fled their destroyed towns on a train, oftentimes three to four deep per seat with nothing but their loved ones and a small bag of whatever is left of their belongings. And then they would ride for 24 hours or more in hopes of finding a safe place somewhere outside their country that they've always called home. They begged us for an end to the war, for protection of the innocent and for justice from the evil they experienced and the desire to simply go home. Sucked in, washed up, blown over. We met Victoria, 
Victoria was uh, uh, several months pregnant with her first baby and alone when she left Kharkiv. She couldn't talk her mother into leaving with her. Can you imagine the desperation? And she bounced around all around Europe looking for a place who would help her care for her newborn. And she didn't find it for two years when she found a place in Poland. One relief worker in Slovakia regularly drives a semi-truck full of basic supplies across the border to bombed out Ukrainian villages and towns. His friend travels with him because his friend has a knack for digging through the rubble and finding trapped children and other survivors. He tells us of one day when he dropped off some supplies at one warehouse and he left the next day and got a phone call that the Russians had sent rocket fire and blew up that same warehouse. He believes that the Russians are watching him in hopes of developing future targets. Can you imagine what that might feel? One young teenage boy we met in Ukraine was staying in the United Methodist long-term housing facility was so psychologically traumatized that he came to meals hours before anyone else because he just couldn't stand to be around other people. We were told stories of sons being killed, husbands never coming home, mothers and fathers lost, and the stories kept coming and kept coming like waves that never ceased. We heard from Ilya and Ina and Sasha and Ludmila and Andrea and Olga and Dinati and Irina and Katerina and Svetlana, Valentina, Tatiana and Anna and so many more. <clears throat> we were so overwhelmed, so overwhelmed with the unfathomable stories of grief and pain and loss and anger and worry that we were left speechless. <coughs> we really had no words to offer. What do you say to someone when they share a story like that? If Chippy, if Chippy was sucked in, washed up and blown over, then these people have been pummeled and swallowed up and vomited out. You see, it's easy to be a Christian when everything's going your way. But how do we stay faithful? How do we stay hopeful? How do we even find joy in life when the storms of doubt and despair and suffering pound on ours and others' lives? Well, Jesus knows something about storms, doesn't he? Today's scripture reveals so much about who Jesus is from a, from a powerful divine authority over creation to a fatigued human who falls asleep at the end of a long day. There's so much we can look at in this story, but I want us to focus on only one detail, one detail that most people miss. And it's this. What does Jesus do in a storm? So Jesus and his disciples have just completed a long, exhausting day teaching and feeding and healing. And Jesus finally calls it a day and tells his companions he wants to go to the other side of the lake. And worn out, Jesus climbs in just as he was, nestles on a cushion in the back of the boat, and falls fast asleep. You see, it's only about an hour trip across the sea by boat. But as the Sea of Galilee is prone to sudden storms, this night would prove to be one of the worst. You see, the Greek word here that Mark uses for storm is lelops. Lelops. And lelops does not indicate just an ordinary rainstorm. It has, a, it has an otherworldly feel to it. In fact, it's the same word used in Job when 
God, for God's voice when God angrily responds to Job's asinine questions and accusations. Lelot, therefore, indicates a violent attack of wind, never a single gust or a constant blowing of wind, but a ferocious storm breaking forth from black thunderclouds in tempestuous gusts with deafening floods of rain and throwing everybody topsy-turvy. In fact, Mark indicates that the boat was being beat up and already being swamped. The disciples were clearly in fear for their lives as they tried to maintain control of the boat and keep it from sinking. But the storm raged on and on. They were probably thrown from the deck like puppets on a string, disoriented, out of control, not knowing which way is which. Their boat was sinking. They were about to perish sucked in, washed up, blown over, quite literally. And what was Jesus doing in the storm? You know, he was sleeping. He was asleep. Really? How could he sleep through all of this? Doesn't he realize that their lives are in mortal danger? The storm, the rages, the boat is going down and God is asleep on the brink of destruction. The disciples had to wake Jesus up and we hear them exclaim what I think are some of the most painful words ever spoken in the Bible. The same words uttered here I've heard uttered in my office. I've heard in hospital rooms, in divorce court, in doctor's offices, in jail cells, in Haiti and in Ukraine and thousands of other storm beaten places. The disciples say to Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care? When you encounter the storms in your life, do you ever feel like Jesus is asleep? Do you ever want to just shake Jesus from his slumber and scream in his face, don't you care? Turning the question into an accusation, don't you care? You see, it's easy to be faithful to God when everything is going your way, isn't it? When our children are healthy, when our economy is booming, when our homes are big and filled with every gadget and the doctor's report shows the picture of health. Oh, we come to church praising a good God who blesses us so greatly. But the problem is that despite our highly educated pastors, our diligent Bible studies, as well as the numerous Christian books, we somehow still hold on to a naive theology of why bad things happen to good people. And if we were honest with ourselves, we tend to believe that when things are going well, then obviously God must be blessing us. God must be pleased with us. But when bad things are going on, then we turn to turn away from God and we turn to blame God and turn to ourselves. We beg God for explanations as if we are somehow entitled to an explanation. And we beg God to take away our pain as if God gave us this pain. But sometimes a storm is just a storm. Sucked in, washed up, and blown over. And in those moments, we may wonder why Jesus is asleep. But here it is, and I don't want you to miss this. This one very important detail in this story. It's easy to miss when you wanna jump right to Jesus calming the storm. Even though Jesus was asleep, he was in the boat. He was in the boat. He wasn't distant from them. He was right there with them. 
His fate was tied to their fate. What would happen to them would happen to him. God did not turn his back on his faithful companions. He got in the boat with them. He knew the storm was coming and he got in the boat with them. The son of God entered fully into the human situation and in their suffering and in their helplessness. You see, no one can really take away our pain and suffering. That's part of our human condition. But those who truly love us, those are the ones who sit with us and go through the suffering with us. You see, in essence, this episode on the water is really a foreshadow of the episode on the cross. Jesus was willing to get on the cross not just with us, but for us. He was willing to take the fate of death on the cross on himself. And when he cried out from the cross, it is finished. That ultimately annihilated sin and death. We can hear the echoes of his words from the boat. Peace, be still. That reminds us that Jesus is in the boat with us. And then Jesus asks a very important question of his disciples. Why are you afraid? In fact, Jesus addresses this topic more than just about any other topic in the Bible. In fact, his words, why are you afraid, do not be afraid, is the most often phrase repeated by Jesus in the Gospels. I wonder why that is. Could it be that fear comes when we forget who's in the boat with us? Fear comes when we wrap our security in an economic system instead of God, right? No wonder we panic when the economy turns. Fear comes when we wrap our faith up in a God when only when everything is going our way. No wonder we freak out when a storm hits. Fear comes when our hope is wrapped up in a relationship or a voting booth or a doctor's report. No wonder we grow angry and skeptical with bad news. Fear comes when we wrap our compassion and our generosity to the poor only when we have a little extra or when there's no panther game or only when we have nothing else to do. And we wonder why our lives fall apart when a crisis hits. When our sense of faith and hope and yes, even joy is wrapped up in the circumstances of life, we have forgotten who is in the boat with us. No wonder we just sit and stare into space and have forgotten our song. It is not a question of if the storms of life will hit us. You know that. It's a question of when. But the good news is that we can face these storms with hope no matter the outcome. because Jesus is in the boat with us. And at the same time, we as Jesus followers, we're called to get into the boat with others when storms hit their lives. When we cry out with intercession, with lament, with groans of prayer too deep for words, we not only remind them that Jesus is with them, that they are not alone and that God will cry out a final peace be still in their lives as well. In fact, that's the whole reason why we went to Ukraine in the first place. Our little team can't stop the war. We can't even really provide much relief in the form of lodging and food and clothing. And much like a weather storm, we really can't do much of anything about the storms they are facing individually. But we can go there. We can sit with them. We can listen to their stories. We can learn their names. And even though we truly cannot understand their terrible pain and suffering, we are willing to travel 5,000 miles to get in the boat with them. To tell them that we care. We have not forgotten you. 
God has not forgotten you. You are not alone. In our final moments together, I want to share with you my most meaningful story from Ukraine. It is the most powerful moment of the mission trip for me. When they invited me to preach in their church in Uzgorod, I had only been given a few days' notice, so I didn't have much time to prepare. But the moment I took the pulpit, an air raid signal blasted throughout the city. But the people kept worshiping. My interpreter read the scripture for the day while the siren was going on and turned and looked at me waiting for me to speak. And here are the words I said, my first words. Dobre ranok, which means good morning. Dobre ranok. I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in Christ, your brothers and sisters in Christ from America and from Providence, UMC, my church. That's right, when you become a believer in Jesus, you join a family that has brothers and sisters all over the globe. It is my honor to greet you as we came to deliver to you one simple message. You are not alone. You are not alone. And then because I don't speak Ukrainian and they don't really speak English, I taught them what I think was, is one of the most powerful expressions of faith in a language that we can all understand, sign language. So I wanna teach it to you. It's this. Put your hands up like this. Go ahead. It won't, it won't hurt. Put your hands up like this, and then you switch hands like this and bring it out. Peace be with you. This is the same expression that Jesus spoke at every resurrection gathering with his disciples. Peace. This is the same expression proclaimed by the angels at Jesus' birth, peace. This is the same expression that literally became a title for Jesus as the Prince of Peace. This is the same expression that Jesus spoke that shushed the raging seas and calmed people's fears, peace, be still. And this is the same expression used to describe what finally is accomplished between God and humans by Jesus' own blood spilt on the cross. Peace be with you. And let me say this in closing. When you face the storms of your life, remember this one thing. Jesus is with you just as he was in the boat. He's in the rubble. He shares in the terror of a nation at war. He is in the makeshift hospitals, in the food lines, in the homeless shelters, in the hospital rooms. He is in the crying and the pain and the grief and the loss. He is in the wailing and the lamenting because he is God with us. God with Ukraine, God with Haiti, God with the grieving, God with all those who suffer injustice and tragedy and ruin. He is God with you and God with me. And every time we climb into the boat with someone else, we remind them that Jesus is with them too. That they are not forgotten. They are not alone.